Hi, welcome back to the Liverpool Fashion Summit. We're joined by Jennifer Davies. Is it Davies or Davis? I, I tend to go for Davis, but you know, either way, apparently that's the Welsh way of saying it. I don't know. Oh, is it Davis? Like Welsh historically, so let's go with that. Okay, welcoming Jennifer Davis. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, Ollie. How are you? I'm not too bad. Are you coping during COVID? Not too bad, actually. Obviously, it's been a, a big change for everybody and lots of adapting, but I've been trying to look on the, the positive sides. I've just been, been quite nice in a way, in many regards, you know, enjoying life for what it is a bit more. And Yeah, you know. everyone's talking about it like it's a bit of a, a reset of what we value and what we care for. And I think it is, yeah. I definitely feel like that. Yeah, and a bit more. I mean, I personally, I'm focusing a lot on family at the moment because they're the only people you can see, <laughs> really. <laughs> oh. No, out of choice then, just out of necessity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm forced <laughs> they to. They don't see that. <laughs> I'm forced to. So, so Jennifer's a uh, a fourth year PhD student. Yes, I'm just my third year for another three weeks, and then I'll be going into final year. So, uh, <laughs> so you're hanging on to them. Three hanging weeks. on to. Yeah, with well, your finger, finger nails in. Very real, but, all of a sudden. So I should say soon to be fourth year PhD student. Soon to student be fourth year PhD student. At the University of Liverpool. So just before we go on to your research then, because we're all fascinated to hear about it. Um, one of my favourite questions, and I heard this on a podcast the other week, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you as long as that's okay. In fact, <laughs> I have two questions. First question is, how would you explain what you do if you were talking to a 10 year old? <laughs> um, oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I explore ways in which people can be nice to each other in, in the creation of garments, clothes. I would probably wouldn't use garments with a 10 year old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, up until that last word, it was really, really good. <laughs> no, Went too academic, it. blew it with the last word. <laughs> no, I bought that. I bought that. No, that's really nice. And I think, I think, because um, it comes from that film, Philadelphia, right? Explain it to me like I'm a four year old. And it's that Albert Einstein thing as well. Get it down as simple as possible. No, <laughs> we like that. And I'll test it on my cousins. <laughs> And then just, just second question, so we get to learn a little bit more about you. What's the song that's going around in your head? The song that's going around in my head recently? Um, <laughs> I don't know. That's a tough question. I have loads of songs going through my head all the time because I, I did a music degree, first of all. So I music is my, my thing. So, yeah. But often I'll just get like a tiny bit of a chorus and it'll just go around my head like over and over and over again. I'm trying yeah. to think what the last thing was that was doing that. Well, I mean, so we could say you you almost have a, a playlist going around in your head. I'll tell you what, the last thing that got stuck in my head, which was yesterday, which is a real throwback, was the Janet Jackson Buster Rhymes collaboration in the 90s. Do you remember it? It's what called was... What's It Gonna Be? No, it was amazing. I if you've that. never seen the. I remember it because it, at the time it was kind of record breaking. It was one of the most expensive music videos ever made. I think it was up yeah. there with like Janet Jackson and Michael Jackson's Scream as being. I think that's still the most expensive. So yeah, that was the last thing. That was a very long-winded answer, sorry. <laughs> no, we'll buy it. Just before you go into your research then, so you've gone from music um, into, uh, into the world of fashion and sustainability. Where's, tell, tell us about that leap. Yeah, so in a nutshell, uh, did a music degree, formed a band, came out of doing the degree, got a record deal. Amazing. Board, played. Glastonbury, all of that kind of thing. Um, I then got a solo deal because the band didn't work out. Got a solo yeah. deal with songwriting, blah, blah, blah. Uh, got dropped around 2015. And mm. at the time, I always used to collaborate with um, a friend of mine who's an amazing photographer and videographer and a fashion designer called yeah. Nabil. And uh, around that time, Nabil had been shortlisted for the LVMH Prize, which was the Louis Vuitton like yeah. young designer prize. And they basically said to him they loved his designs, um, but he didn't have a business, like he didn't have a, a single stockist at the time. So I was going through all of this stuff with the record label and trying to figure out what my next steps were and feeling, I guess, a bit disheartened and not, you know, yeah. I didn't let myself wallow in it, but 
um, you know, it was a disappointment. It's a, like, it's a bit of a gut shot, isn't it? It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. massively. But I'm never one for, you know, moping or feeling sorry for myself. And so Nabil said, you know, how would you feel about coming and, and building the brand? And because um, my parents run their own business. So I, I guess I just had like a gut instinct for, I guess it's just common sense, really, when it comes yeah, to running yeah. business, you know? So we embarked on that. And I was going to be in charge of like overseeing all the production. Um, very quickly realized I knew nothing about production or supply chain management or anything like that. So I went back to university and did my master's in operations and supply chain management mm -hmm. and didn't realize I was going to enjoy it as much as I did. Like I really, really, it was challenging, but I really, really enjoyed it. And I yeah. felt like it really helped my practice. Um, with regards to the business and the way I was thinking about that. And equally, it kind of gave me a, I guess, a real life case study is how these yeah. things are being actioned in reality. And yeah. I felt one, one fed the other quite well. And then the opportunity came around for me, you know, my, my supervisor for my uh, master's thesis and also um, Andy Lyons, who was yeah. head of the course at the time, obviously he's now head of department. Um, they were both very encouraging about applying to do the PhD. And uh, so I did and I got the scholarship. And so, yeah, that was it as Amazing. fast as I could possibly explain it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was really good. I feel like we got, we got, we, we know Jennifer a little bit more now. We know you a little bit more. So go on then, just c continue with your story because it is fascinating. So you've, uh, so you've now started your PhD. Um, your three nearly four years in just to remind you um tell us about your your a sort of a broad overview of your research in general and, and then and then after that just because i think it's important to the people who uh, you know could be watching this um i'd just like to touch on on your your business and the thing that that you just mentioned about with it but like, let's stick at the research first yeah so the research i think my fascination with sustainability came when i was doing my my master's thesis um and i was looking specifically at you know business models within the industry and i think you know this is why i, f I felt like having the the practitioner side of things really helped because i was getting very frustrated with the industry that you know i felt like as a company we were practicing a lot of the sort of sustainable credentials or you yeah. know you know naturally just because we were manufacturing in London at a really sort of high quality establishment that were paying everybody well and you know I think naturally with the luxury industry there's a focus on quality and that tends to go hand in hand with respecting craft and respecting the people that are making the garments and things yeah. like that so um, I was finding it quite frustrating that there wasn't a way to prove these things particularly and started investigating you know this whole concept as a form of a a new business model and I was reading it was a um a W oh, I think it was a World Wildlife funded piece of research mm. that was talking about deep luxury and the idea of redefining what luxury is through sustainability and, and better practice. Yeah. And I was also reading a lot of research that actually it was quite damning of the luxury industry in respect that they hadn't been under as much scrutiny as the fast fashion brands had who were making all the headlines with you know obviously the terrible rana the plaza yeah, collapse focus was there wasn't it the yeah. focus was very much there and luxury brands uh, or many luxury brands kind of evaded that scrutiny and so i feel like there's this kind of divide between the luxury industry between those who are you know either consciously or indirectly practicing sustainable supply chain management yeah and then those who are kind of using this shield and i think as well with luxury consumers there's a assumption that because of the high price point sustainability is to be assumed yeah 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 which i think some brands capitalize on and green Even when they're not doing it yeah so yeah, there's yeah. all of these complex things going on that were of great interest to me and so that's where it, it started and i felt that there was a an opportunity to explore this further particularly because 
you know, we're seeing a lot of stuff about industry 4.0, supply chain yeah. 4.0, and these technologies which might enable greater tr supply chain transparency, which might offer brands like, you know, my brand, the platform to be able to prove our credentials and create a more um, structured business model or, you know, a bit more of a tangible business model for, for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so don't plagiarize yourself, <laughs> but <laughs> what, what's kind of the main things that you found then? So we know, we know your interest that to the beginning, take us to the end. And I know you haven't finished just yet. And please uh, don't yes. plagiarize yourself, but what, what, what could we learn from the stuff that you're already doing? I think what I'm finding the other the other kind of key angle is um, obviously uh, people such as John Elkington, you know, founder of the Triple Bottom Line and things like yeah. that. And he published a really interesting article in the Harvard Business Review in 2018 where he offered to conduct a management concept recall because he felt like the Triple Bottom Line was not being used in the way that was intended, and still we're struggling to move beyond the financial bottom line and Absolutely. it's still driving everything. So I guess where I'm at with my thinking at the moment is like, okay, well, if businesses are struggling to think beyond that, if they're, if they're struggling to integrate sustainable supply chain management from a purely altruistic perspective, yeah, then we need to help businesses overcome that and create a business case for doing it. And that is what I'm finding with my research is, throughout the supply chain, when people are doing it, it's typically, and don't get me wrong, there are cases where I've met owners and designers who that's just morally what they feel they want to commit to. Who they but are. And there yeah. also is the side of the d debate, and I do relate to this, especially because, you know, with being a business owner, is that you have to be profitable <laughs> to yes. exist. So it is a balancing act. So I think, focus should be on helping brands and businesses to create a, a more clear business case. Yeah. So then it kind of turns me on to technology and solutions and, and things like that. But I think the issue with fashion is in terms of it's it as an organizational field, mm -hmm. it's extremely opaque. It's extremely complex. And the motivations for increasing transparency often aren't there. Yeah. Um, there's still so much unknown about, or so many unknowns with regards to consumer demand for these types of, you know, sustainable products. And, yeah. you know, and even with consumers, consumers greenwash. <laughs> yes. Even yeah, if yeah. they say they want to buy, do they, when it actually comes to that, are they willing to pay that additional Price. I think that That's needs to the trade-off, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, needs to be far more researched on that. And I think there's this misconception of fashion as like a high-tech industry. Yeah. Um, and through my research, I've discovered that it's absolutely not the case <laughs> at all. Um, it's really that has been like you know a big discovery for me. Yeah. Because I think we always associate, particularly luxury fashion, with innovation. Um, cutting edge but yeah. that is that whilst that might be the case with regards to design I think the back of house the supply chain not the case at all no cobbled together yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, you know some of it really is um, it's <laughs> it's surprising and yeah you know, I, I think um, I interviewed a very senior member of a very well-known brand yeah and they felt that there was this um myth that innovation and technology are synonymous with one another yeah and he was just like we've been doing the same thing in our factories for years and it works like do i really need a microsoft smart board to digitize everything or does the post-it board post-it notes on a whiteboard work just fine yeah yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah no it's a good um, point keep it, keep it as simple and if it's not broken don't fix it right yeah so there's you know there's all of these promises of technologies that are going to revolutionize things but my personal feeling is that's quite a long way off for the fashion yeah. supply chain 
Yeah. Or unless we can uncover a, a way of creating a, a value creation business case, which I do think is possible. For, so from like a differentiation strategy point of view, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry, I've rambled. No, I've rambled. no, I mean, it's a, uh, but <laughs> you, you needed to, because it's a complex environment it's and situation. So multifaceted and lots of different yeah, yeah. arguments. Rather you than me, sister. Um, <laughs> so... Thank you for that. So it's it's great. And I think there's there's a lot of questions come out of that. Well, for me, and I'm sure for other people who watch it as well. Just tell us a bit about your business then. So, so um, yeah, so Nabil was a collaborator of mine. Like he used to lend me clothes from a music video and I would help him out with photo shoots and um, with the photographer that I mentioned. And so we started off the business and our first ever customer, which was off the back of LVMH the first time that Nabil was shortlisted, yeah. was Carl Lagerfeld from Chanel. Wow, he, okay, yeah. He bought one of our shirts and then he later photographed Jerry Hall wearing it. And we basically launched the brand off that story. I mean, yeah, it was yeah. an unbelievable bit of PR, I suppose, really for a young designer to have Carl exclaiming that he loved it in front of everybody at LVMH and buying it right there yeah, and there. Yeah. It was quite remarkable. So we used that and then we um, we worked with, uh, well, it was Vogue Talents, but it's actually like the Italian equivalent of the British Fashion Council. Okay. Offered us the opportunity to showcase at Milan Fashion Week. Yeah, yeah. And there we managed to secure our first stockists. Um, which was crazy because the stockist was a Japanese stockist. It was a really cool concept store in Japan. Yeah. The lady only spoke French and my French is extremely <laughs> limited. <laughs> so there was me trying to make this sale in French in Milan, you know, it's yeah. just ridiculous. You can't but, write it. No, you couldn't, but it was our first ever proper sale. And yeah. that was an exciting moment. We thought, oh, wow, we can actually do this. So from there, you know, we, it was very hard because we didn't have any startup capital or anything like that. Okay. So it was very tightly managing the cash flow and, you know, trying any profits that we had, we would obviously reinvest back and try and do more and more. And then we eventually worked up to showcasing with the British Fashion Council through their, um, it's called London Showrooms, which is their platform in Paris where they showcase yeah. emerging British designers. And that yeah. was like a real turning point for us um it was like a proper seal of approval and i felt like some of the buyers that were a bit on the fence were like oh okay this brand is is doing they're, something this they're, they're serious about this yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um because you know it's it's a risk for some of these retailers to take a chance on the smaller brands where they've not got any sales history yeah. it's not like some of the big brands where they've literally been in store for 20 years or whatever so yeah it's a sure, um, they're a sure bet then aren't they yeah, yeah. and we just kept you know grafting away and then we did our first show uh on the official london fashion week schedule in well, two years ago so september 2018 yeah. and we did that in partnership with the british library which was incredible it was the first time the library had ever allowed um a designer to put on a show there and um, yeah. so that was phenomenal so we've had some real like key milestones and we were also then finalists for the LVMH prize so that was nice to to go back and have it recognized that not only did they like it creatively, but they could see how hard we'd worked to actually yeah. build the business from scratch. You know, I'm really proud that we did that with no startup capital. Oh, like, God, yeah. And it, so it can be done. I think it that's can one, be done. That's one thing we can all take, it can be done. And it can be done whilst you're doing a PhD as well. It can be done whilst you're doing a PhD. But, you know, it's, it's amazing because, you know, we... We secure contracts with Selfridges, Harvey Nichols in the Middle East. We've done shows in Dubai and it's taken, taken us to some amazing yeah. places and, and really see the industry, what it's like from the ground up to operating at a, a high level um, and what it takes to do that and what it takes to manage a supply chain and manage yeah. production. And because it's not just the production of the initial collection with the samples and that in, in itself is a big enough challenge but then it's trying to do it on, on a bigger scale and some of these things don't you can't get the economies of scale no. and blah, blah. anyway sorry again i feel like i'm 
no just we love it hey, at any point. <laughs> no we, we could be here for hours you could be here for hours so but just before we do go then um last question you're not gonna like it okay what's fashion gonna be like in 10 years uh i think there's a lot of i mean do you mean with regards to sustainability or uh yes okay no. with it, to... it's two questions really sorry someone picked me up on this the other day there's what's the future like if we do nothing and what's the future like if we all start actually doing something so there's two states that we can be heading towards right if we do nothing i think obviously the consequences are not good um you know we've had these remarkable and very tragic wake-up calls in recent history you know i mean rana plaza is one of the worst industrial accidents ever recorded um and yet i think people quickly forget um about these things when it comes to purchasing decisions if we do nothing, I worry we will have more incidents like that. Yeah. Obviously, more damage to the environment, more waste. I mean, that, I think that's pretty evident. Um, however, there is the potential. And I think, you know, we, we spoke earlier about COVID and how it's been a bit of a landmark just in terms of life in general. And the yeah, yeah. View things, but I think the same is the case for the industry. And I've read a lot of articles about how you know, it's kind of forced fashion to, it's at a bit of a crossroads because it was forced into a, a standstill with no shows, no, you know, yeah. not as much in way of production and sales. And it's kind of just come to a standstill. Um, and with that comes a moment of reflection to think about, you know, what industry do we want to have in the future, yeah. in the next five, 10, 20 years? Um, the optimistic side of me hopes that we will now embark on a more sustainable path and you know I think a lot of it boils down to overconsumption it's yeah. powered by this relentless fashion cycle and obviously we've had brands like Gucci recently come out and say that they they are no longer going to do six shows a year and they're just going to do two shows and so I think there's promise um interestingly with my research a lot of people feel a huge amount of hope about new wave of talent design talent coming through yeah. that's where they see the biggest hope um and there's people now you know coming out of design school that refuse to go and work for companies you know they really do have this moral standpoint of like i don't want to be a contributor to this industry to this culture of overconsumption yeah. um and even one of the uh, supply chain directors for a really big brand that i interviewed they said now that it's with regards to employees he said you know five ten years ago they were this super hot brand that everybody wanted to work for and now he's noticing that they have to make a real concerted effort with regards to what they stand for as a company in terms of attracting talent right so i thought that was an yeah. interesting you know even internally within companies they're having to think about this so yeah i think there's opportunity there however i guess the more cynical side of me thinks is it just going to be business as usual once if you know covid touch wood hopefully continues to um ease and and we recover from this um okay. I don't know. I, I I would like to think that there will be a fundamental change and a fundamental shift. Time will tell, I suppose. Time will tell. What a perfect phrase to finish on. <laughs> <laughs> time will tell. No, but Jennifer, thank you so much for your time. And, You're um, welcome. I hope you... I haven't rambled too much. No, it's been great. It's better than my voice. <laughs> and we'll, um, we'll see you at the round table, won't we? Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Ollie. Bye.